Hi, I'm Caitlin. Hi, I'm Rebecca. We're not from Memphis, but we love it. Welcome to Memphis Type History, the podcast. Hello, Caitlin. Hello, Rebecca. <laughs> Are you mocking me every time you say that? Um, <laughs> no, I wouldn't say it's mocking. It's more like... <laughs> Reciprocating? I feel super fake saying it, so it's just coming across that way. <laughs> yeah. And how about I give the introduction to this episode without knowing anything at all about what this episode is going to be about? As a piece of performance? Yeah, like, I'll help you with the intro by giving you your intro, and then that'll help you flow into the episode. Okay. Okay. On this week's episode of Memphis Type History, the podcast, you're going to be listening and hearing about a very impactful radio show called... WDIA. And with us today is Caitlin Horton, who is half of Memphis type history, <laughs> <laughs> who's done a thorough investigation and research of this WDIA radio station. Here she is to tell us about it. Thank you, Caitlin. You're very welcome, Rebecca. You were right at the end of your intro where you said WDIA, the radio station. Because it was that- so much more than a radio show. It was a full okay. station. <laughs> was it? That is important in history. Was it yeah. radio and television? No, just radio. Okay. Okay. We don't need crazy TV stuff. We got radio. On June 7th, 1947, WDIA transmitted onto the radio waves for the very first time from its 2074 Union Avenue studio, one of just six stations in the city of Memphis at that time. I like that you're using your radio voice right now. I'm going to try to keep it up the whole time, but <laughs> yes. I bet it goes away. <laughs> <laughs> Owned by John Pepper and Bert Ferguson, two white guys, the station played pop and country western music. And it headed towards bankruptcy very quickly. Mm. But in October of 1948, they hired high school teacher and columnist Nat D. Williams who then started the first radio show for black listeners in the United States on WDIA. The very first? The very first. Very cool. And it would save the station. Yes. His show, Tantown Jubilee, catapulted WDIA to the second spot for radio stations in Memphis. So it was this regular radio station where they played pop, country, western, heading toward bankruptcy. Then they hired this guy to do this one show, and it... That one show made it the second most popular station all of a sudden. Oh, okay. So the station would get bomb threats and stuff like that, but it was obvious that black programming uh, was making them money. So the station became the top station in Memphis after making the switch to all black programming and all black on-air talent. So it was African-American radio made by African-Americans for African-Americans. All right. So in 1954, the station increased to 50,000 watts, which meant that it reached into the Mississippi Delta, into a bit of Missouri, and down to the Gulf Coast. And that means that it reached 10% of the black population in the United States at that time, which is a lot of people. Oh, wow. Yeah. The station would go on to be known as the Star Maker Station because of the amount of exposure it could provide to local talent. One thing that was also really instrumental in the station's success was that Williams, the, the guy with the first radio show, he was friends with Rufus Thomas, and he got him onto the station. And then Thomas actually stayed on his show until his death in 2001. Oh, wow. Their ties to Beale Street got B.B. King's career off to a start on the station, as well as a lot of other musicians. And then after Beale Street began to climb, WDIA was really the big source of musical influence in the area, and even Elvis listened to it and it inspired him in his work. Very good. At one point, a marketing campaign uh, positioned the station as the Goodwill station, and then a new show called Goodwill came on the air, and it would talk about random town news. It gave out civic news and did missing children announcements, collected money for community projects and things like scholarships. They bought a bus for disabled kids, helped them get to school. Uh, little league teams they funded, and they made an orphanage. That's just a few of the projects. Is this in connection to the, the Goodwill that we know today? No, it's not. It's different. Oh, okay. Okay. They then turned this, like, fundraising success and the success of, of, like, creating Goodwill in the community into big fundraisers that WDIA DJs would host. 
And they would have like 12,000 people at these events. And it was called the Goodwill Review and the Starlight Review. And really big local and national musicians like B.B. King, Rufus Thomas, Robbie Blue, Bland, The Spirit of Memphis, Elvis, Sam Cooke, Muddy Waters, and Ray Charles performed at these for free. For free. Just to help like raise money. Yeah, because it was raising money for the black community and it was making a really big difference to a lot of people's lives. That's great. And Elvis playing at it was kind of a big deal because his contract didn't actually allow him to do it. And this kind of plays in. So he played this show, even though he wasn't really allowed to. And he did it after he attended the colored night at the fairgrounds uh, in that past June. Okay. So it was kind of in a year he did two things towards trying to break up segregation. Yeah, anyway, the local black community received around $100,000 a year from all of the goodwill efforts. Very cool. So even though black talent and black music made WDIA what it was, and the staff was integrated in 1950, which was rare for the South, it wasn't until 1972 that Chuck Scruggs became the first black general manager and vice president. So all the on-air talent was black, but like the staff wasn't. Oh. That was still all white. Yeah, until 1972. Under his 12-year service, the station helped raise money to preserve the Lorraine Motel and helped to create the National Civil Rights Museum, and they participated in the revitalization of Bill Street and the creation of the Stax Museum. That's a lot. So remained very influential. Yeah. Yeah. So if you listen to WDIA today, it really doesn't play much of its original content of gospel music and Bill Street blues Instead, it focuses on music from the 60s to today, and it's pretty heavy on 70s soul. So that's what you'll find. Now, was this a WDIA that was uh, located in the Chiska, or am I confusing that with a different radio station? Yeah, was it at the Chiska? I'm not positive. Uh, I just tried looking it up, and I can't see easily. But I did see, I mean, there was another radio station that was at the Chiska for sure. I know there's just so much crossover between uh, Sam Phillips and the Chiska, and then Sam Phillips would use WDIA to sort of test out music and see how popular it was going to be, that sort of stuff. So oh, okay. I'm not positive it could have been there. I wish I could see the answer for sure. Hmm. They may have hosted some shows in different places. Yeah. That's the thing is I get it confused, those two locations, Union and Chiska. Yeah. I can't tell. I don't think it was in the Chiska, but I'm not positive. It's a question for Jimmy Ogle. Yeah. Yeah, we should ask Jimmy Ogle. (laughs) He'll know. (laughs) As usual, uh, anyone who's listened to any of my episodes before, I like to do who's who. So I like to do the history and I like to tell about the people. So as usual, I have a who's who. (laughs) We should create a little soundbite for that. For whenever you want to do who's who, it'd be like, who's who or something. Oh. You know, you push a button and it creates a little soundbite. Go for it. Tell us who's who on WDIA. All right. First up, native Memphian Martha Jean, the Queen Steinberg, was one of the first women disc jockeys on the radio when she joined WDIA in 1954. And at some point, she became the pastor of her own church, too. Wow. Before that, she was a fashion show producer. And she was also married to a trumpeter named Luther Steinberg, which I just found fascinating. I don't know why. (laughs) Just a trumpeter. I think it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like they must have been like a pretty cool couple to be around. Mm-hmm. She replaced some of the women DJs on their shows when they cycled out for various reasons. And she also had her own show called Premium Stuff <laughs> that played current R&B hits and gave household hints, which was pretty common for women broadcasters to do at that time. Okay. In 1962, she moved to Detroit and continued in radio. On the evening of July 23rd, during the 1967 Detroit riot, she convinced her station to cancel its usual programming and let her go on air to call for people to calm down and stop rioting. (laughs) And many believe that her efforts actually prevented the riot from being worse than it could have been. Wow. Also at WJLB in Detroit, she led a protest against how the station only had black on-air personalities, but no black staff members. Ooh, she caught them out. Mm Mm-hmm. In 1980, the station changed to FM, and her show got dropped during the changeover. So in 1982, she bought the former AM station and changed it to gospel music. She stayed on air until her death in 2000. In 2017, she was inducted into the Rhythm and Blues Hall of Fame. And you're not going to believe this. She's buried in Elmwood Cemetery, (laughs) but in Detroit. Oh, there's an Elmwood Cemetery in Detroit? 
<laughs> yes, apparently so. <laughs> oh, the connection. Yeah. All right, next. Maurice Hot Rod Holbert was another WDIA jockey who went on to work in Baltimore in 1951 as the first full-time African-American DJ on an all-white station. And he was inducted into the National Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Cool. It's like, these people are like major stars. <laughs> yeah, they are. Basically. Holbert was a trained Volvo actor before he started working at WDIA with B.B. King and Rufus Thomas, among others. And also notable was that he owned the first black dance studio in Memphis, and he ran several restaurants. And I'm going to name them in case anybody knows what they are, because I love all the names. They were called The Harlem House, The Flamingo, in the Manhattan. Wow. Sounds like he came from Las Vegas. He was really well connected as well. I guess from these restaurants, from his radio show, maybe from his vaudeville, I don't know, but he knew everybody. And so he could book big talent for different stuff. So he could book black baseball teams, people like Duke Ellington. And he was really influential throughout his life in helping black musicians like Aretha Franklin and others in the entire African American community to prosper so it's pretty cool old hot rod i've already been uh throwing his name around a little bit in 1949 bb king joined the rest of the on-air talent at wdia for a 15-minute promotional show oh uh first he sold a medicine called pepticon he sold a medicine <laughs> yeah a medicine uh pepticon spelled p-e-p-t-i-k-o-n and then he also sold lucky strikes the cigarettes yeah <laughs> <laughs> Cigarettes and medicine. That's a good combo. Yeah, it is, right? Pepticon. What, can I ask what Pepticon did? Because I'm really intrigued by all this. I don't know. I, I think it was one of those like cure-alls. Like, uh, you have all these problems, take some Pepticon. <laughs> Wait, that could be anything. I know. I'll look it up and see. Maybe there's a recording <laughs> of him doing these... Yeah, he would like promote them. I think he wrote some jingles. It probably is for a little... Pep to your day. Make Maybe. you feel a uh, feel good. Yeah. Maybe it became Pepto Bismol. <laughs> yeah, or that. The next year he became an afternoon DJ uh, because he took over one of Maurice Hot Rod Holbert's shows. BB mm -hmm. King really credits WDIA with playing a huge role in launching his career because it helped him gain confidence and it gave him an audience as well. Yeah, I love that about that guy. Is he um such an amazing talent, but he didn't see himself as that, which is Interesting. Everyone should watch uh, Life of Riley. Oh, it was so good. It's about B.B. King. Okay. Let's put that in the show notes. It's so good. All right. Next. Theo, bless my bones, Wade, became Memphis's most popular gospel <laughs> DJ. <laughs> bless my bones. He got that nickname because one time he spilled hot coffee during his first broadcast and he shouted out, bless my bones, into the mic, <laughs> I guess it is. <laughs> He was really involved in the gospel music scene in town. He managed the most popular quartet called Spirit of Memphis, and he produced a gospel concert that featured really big names, and it'd be like 25,000 people came and filled up a baseball stadium. Oh, wow. For that concert. Yeah. Big stuff. Oh, bless my bones. All right. Last one. And I think you're really going to like it. I think so, too. I'm going to say I think this might be your favorite. Willa Monroe who show Tantown Homemakers, launched in August 1949 in response to her popular guest appearances on Tantown Jubilee. It was broadcast for middle-class Black housewives on weekdays from 9 to 10 a.m. And the music that was played was called Soft Ballads. It's like Eartha Kitt, Dinah Washington, etc. And there was also recipes, society news, and interviews with other popular African-American women. But here's what's amazing that I like. She was a really big time socialite and she had a 20 room mansion where she entertained. What? <laughs> yeah. She got it from her wealthy lover, Robin Wright, who was a band leader and he yes. owned the Brown Derby, which was Memphis's biggest African American nightclub. So I bet they threw good parties. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, her show was a huge hit right away. And by 1950, 40% of the Memphis listening audience tuned in to Tantown Homemakers. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. But, okay, she had a 20-room mansion, so I really doubt, though, that she was using her own tips for cleaning and cooking, right? Well, you know, that was a thing of the past, so 
she's above, you know, like she probably had people doing that stuff for her. Yeah, but she probably I think could tell them if it was done right or not. She probably picked the best of the best. Yeah, probably could, probably could. Mm-hmm. But yeah. That's uh, WDIA. Very nice. The Star Maker Station. Well, I'm going to post some stuff. I've got some links for further reading. I mean, there's actually like, uh, this is actually a huge topic. WDIA reaches into so many different areas, and this is really just like an overview, to Mm -hmm. be honest. So I'm going to post links for further reading. I'll post pictures of some of the DJs and stuff that we talked about, and I'll try to find some recordings too and try to post those as well. That'd be awesome. For memphistypehistory.com slash WDIA, right? Oh, yes. memphistypehistory.com slash WDIA. Good call, Rebecca, on giving actual show notes links. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it happens every now and then. All right. Well. Well, bless my bones. This is Memphis Type History, the podcast. We like your type. You've been listening to Memphis Type History, the podcast. It would mean so much to us if you head over to iTunes and give us a rating and review. Be sure to subscribe and never miss an episode. Want to be part of Memphis Type History and get behind the scenes content, merch, and more? Support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Memphis Type History. That's Patreon spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Memphis Type History. Find more Memphis Type History on our blog at memphistypehistory.com, on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest as Memphis Type History, and on Twitter at Memphis Type. <laughs>